The singing wilderness has to do with the calling of the loons, the northern lights, and the great silences of a land lying northwest of Lake Superior. It is concerned with the simple joys, the timelessness, and perspective found in a way of life that is close to the past. I have heard the singing in many places, but I seem to hear it best in the wilderness lake country of the Quatico Superior, where travel is still by pack and canoe over the ancient trails of the Indians and voyagers. I have heard it on misty migration nights when the dark has been alive with the high calling of birds and in rapids when the air has been full of their rushing thunder. I have caught it at dawn when the mists were moving out of the bays and on cold winter nights when the stars seemed close enough to touch. But the music can even be heard in the soft guttering of an open fire or in the beat of rain on a tent. The horizon was brightening now. Mists were beginning to move with the rising of the sun. Gradually, the streamers of rose and mauve in the east changed to gold, and then the sun burst over a spruce-etched hill. Early morning in the wilderness is the time for smells, before senses have become contaminated with common odors, while they are still aware and receptive. One of the grandest smells of all is the combination of pine and spruce and balsam, when you can catch the wind blowing over a thousand miles of them, the smell of warming trees and resins. Beside me was a balsam, and I took a handful of the needles and rubbed them in the palm of my hand. Now they smelled as needles should, of the wilderness with its sparkling lakes, its portages and campsites and a thousand things that played havoc with my peace of mind. The lake was breathing softly, as in sleep, rising and falling. It seemed to me to absorb like a great sponge all the sounds of the earth. It was a time of quiet, no wind rustling the leaves, no lapping of the water, no calling of animals or birds. But I listened just the same, straining with all my faculties towards something, I knew not what, trying to catch the meanings that were there. As I stood there and listened, I had visions of what was to come. For that sound was part of many things. Trout streams in May, lakes calm in the twilight, hazy afternoons with the smell of smoke in the air, loons calling on the open water. Then at last I was back, and as I paddled along and saw the old familiar reaches of blue, the islands riding at anchor in the distance, the gnarled old trees and lichen-covered cliffs, it seemed as though I had never been away. The charm of a canoe trip is in the quiet as one drifts along the shores, being a part of rocks and trees and every living thing. I passed between islands thickly wooded with jack pine and spruce, Beaver houses that had once stood high were now almost submerged, and freshly peeled twigs of aspen around them told that their occupants were abroad. The loons were calling, as they had always called, in welcome to a voyager. Here the caribou moss grows and has never been disturbed. Caribou moss is a lichen, and therefore a pioneer among plants, taking root on any barren, rocky surfaces where broken crystalline structures will hold the spores. While the granite surfaces of the rock mass are still covered with lichens, along its edges gnarled and stunted pines, junipers and cedars are reaching down into the rock itself, forcing huge slabs away from the ridge, 
breaking and probing new pathways for their ever-hungry roots. Some lichens are like cracked and brittle paint against the rock. Others like old-fashioned gray-green rosettes. But the caribou moss is like dwarf clumps of leafless shrubs. Nearby is a deep cushion of caribou moss. It is damp with dew, soft and resilient as spun rubber. It shines with a luster that is now grayish-green, now the color of old and tarnished silver. This morning, the caribou moss is alive and growing, but by noon, the drying sun will stop all activity of the algae within it. A prolonged dry spell and the delicate stems will be like powder, crunch like brittle glass underfoot. A rain, a fall of dew, and it will swiftly spring to life. The leaves and duff looked good to me. I wanted to burrow into the crumbling dark humus underneath, feel it, smell it, and steep myself in its warmth. Just as I hauled in my line for the hundredth time, something took hold and began to move away. I played out line ten, twenty, thirty feet and struck hard. The hook set firmly and the fun began. Wild dashes, swirling dives to the bottom, long uncertain sulks. I lay my face close to the water, watching for the flash of ghostly silver. The movement of a canoe is like a reed in the wind. Silence is part of it, and the sounds of lapping water, bird songs, and the wind in the trees. It is part of the medium through which it floats, the sky, the water, the shores. A man is part of his canoe, and therefore part of all it knows. The instant he dips a paddle, he flows as it flows, the canoe yielding to his slightest touch, responsive to his every whim and thought. The paddle is an extension of his arm, as his arm is a part of his body. To the canoeman, there is nothing that compares with the joy he knows when a paddle is in his hand. The canoe gives a sense of unbounded range and freedom, unlimited movement and exploration, such as larger craft never know. It is as free as the wind itself, can go wherever fancy dictates. The canoeman can camp each night in a different place, explore out of the way streams and their sources, find hidden corners where no one has ever been. Should you be lucky enough to be moving across a calm surface with mirrored clouds, you may have the sensation of suspension between heaven and earth, of paddling not on the water, but through the skies themselves. There is magic in the feel of a paddle and the movement of a canoe, a magic compounded by distance, adventure, solitude, and peace. The way of a canoe is the way of the wilderness, and of a freedom almost forgotten. It is an antidote to insecurity, the open door to waterways of ages past, and a way of life with profound and abiding satisfactions. When a man is part of his canoe, he is part of all that canoes have ever known. When he has traveled for many days, 
and is far from settlements of his kind. When he looks over his cruising outfit and knows it is all he owns, that he can travel with it to new country as he wills, he feels at last that he is down to the real business of living, that he has shed much of what was unimportant and is in an old, polished groove of experience. Life, for some strange reason, has suddenly become simple and complete. His wants are few, confusion and uncertainty gone, his happiness and contentment deep. Approaching the first portage, we could hear the roar of the rapids, and we landed high above so as not to be sucked into the current. Dangerous though they may be, treacherous and always unpredictable, no one who has known the canoe trails of the north does not love their thunder and the rush of them. What a good feeling to throw on the packs and slog down the trail. And what a joy to see those rapids again and hear their rushing through the gorge. The river now tumbled through a narrow, rocky canyon. Flush and churning golden brown, it bored its way through gorges and dells, swirled in foam-laced whirlpools and fought the windfalls and debris of the spring before. No man who has portaged around Whitewater studied the swirls and smooth, slick sweeps and the V's that point the way above the breaks has not wondered if he should try. Only fools run rapids, say the Indians. But I know this. As long as there are young men with the light of adventure in their eyes and a touch of wilderness in their souls, rapids will be run. Though I bemoan the recklessness of youth, I wonder what the world would be like without it. I know it is wrong, but I am for the spirit that makes young men do the things they do. I am for the glory that they know. Wherever there are waterways, there are connecting trails between them, portages used by primitive man for countless centuries before discovery. Although overgrown and sometimes hard to find, they are always there, and when you pack your outfit across them, you are part of a great company that has passed before. When you camp in ancient campsites, those voyagers of the past camp with you. The canoe was getting heavy, its carrying yoke biting into my shoulders, the pack straps cutting my wind. As I stagger on beneath my load, I realize that aesthetic enjoyment and packing are not always complementary, that there is not the full appreciation of smells and vistas and sounds when every step is an effort. There in a patch of pines, I dropped my load and sank down wearily beside it. It was good to rest, good to breathe evenly once more, to see out of my eyes no longer bleared with sweat. Nothing could ever be more completely satisfying than rest after a long portage. Gradually, my heart stopped its pounding and my breathing became quiet. I stretched out on a smooth carpet of needles and looked up through the pines to the blue sky overhead. There is satisfaction in reaching some point on the map in spite of wind and weather, in keeping a rendezvous with some campsite that in the morning seemed impossible of achievement. That is why when, after a day of battle, your tent is pitched at last in the lee of some sheltering cliff, the canoe up safe and dry, and supper underway, there is an exaltation that only canoemen know. It was good to make camp again, get the tent up, the sleeping bags laid out, and a fire underway. Who can place a price tag on anything so wonderful? Something happens to a man when he sits before a fire. Strange stirrings take place within him, and a light comes into his eyes which was not there before. 
An open flame suddenly changes his environment to one of adventure and romance. Around a fire, men feel that the whole world is their campsite, and all men partners of the trail. On any wilderness expedition, it always serves as a climax to the adventures of the day, is as important to a complete experience as the final curtain to a play. In years of roaming the wilds, my campfires seem like glowing beads in a long chain of experiences. Some of the beads glow more than the others, and when I blow on them ever so softly, they burst into flame. Those old fires have strange and wonderful powers. Even their memories make life the adventure it was meant to be. Anyone who has traveled in the wilds knows how much he looks forward to the time of day when he can lay down his burden and make camp. He pictures the ideal place and all that he must find there. Water, a good wood supply, protection from the wind and weather. As shadows begin to lengthen, the matter of a campsite takes precedence over everything else, as it has for ages past whenever men have been on the move. The camp with its fire has always been the goal, a place worth striving toward, and once attained, worth defending against all comers. After supper we paddled to the cliff and sat there studying the Indian paintings, the imprints of hands, the moose, the war canoes, the suns and moons. You find these pictographs in the Quetico Superior country, on smooth vertical surfaces of rock along some of the major routes of travel. The reddish-brown pigment used was a mixture of iron oxide and fish oil. But who did them, or when they were done, no one seems to know. I like to believe that those paintings were records of exploits of the past, of heroic adventures on the warpath, or on hunting expeditions, that those who were allowed to dip their hands in the pigment and leave their imprints on the rock were those who had covered themselves with glory. The last level rays of the sunset caught a stand of dark pine on the opposite shore and brushed the trunks with flame. The lake was calm, and its islands floated like battleships in a sea of crimson. Far in the distance, the loons called. The loons are part of the vast solitude. My memory is full of their calling. In the morning, when the white horses of the mists are galloping out of the bays. At midday, when their long, lazy bugling is part of the calm. And at dusk, when their music joins with that of the hermit thrushes and the wilderness going to sleep. The sun was trembling on the edge of the ridge. It was alive, almost fluid and pulsating. And as I watched it sink, I thought that I could feel the earth turning from it, actually feel its rotation. Over all was the silence of the wilderness, that sense of oneness which comes only when there are no distracting sights or sounds. When we listen with inward ears and see with inward eyes. When we feel and are aware with our entire beings rather than our senses. I thought as I sat there of the ancient admonition, Be still and know that I am God, and knew that without stillness there can be no knowing. Without divorcement from outside influences, man cannot know what spirit means. The singing wilderness has to do with the calling of the loons, the northern lights, and the great silences of a land lying northwest of Lake Superior. I have discovered that I am not alone in my listening, that almost everyone is listening for something, that the search for places where the singing may be heard goes on everywhere. It seems to be a part of the hunger that all of us have for a time when we were closer to lakes and rivers, to mountains and meadows and forests than we are today.